Hello, South Africa, and welcome back to CoronaCast, your twice-weekly information program, keeping you at home up to date with the latest information around the COVID virus and its impact on South African, as well as dealing with the issues that uh, you've been sending through. And thank you very much for all of you who've been writing in and saying, uh, sharing with us the topics you would like us to cover. We got great feedback from our one uh, last week on uh, rural safety, and thank you very much for the suggestions and the, the comments and, uh, and the feedback we received. They were very, very gratefully received. So do keep writing in. We do read your emails, and they certainly get sent off uh, to the right people to, to have a look at uh, and help us to inform our policies. Well, today is day 96. Can you believe it? Saturday will be 100 days of the extended lockdown, and uh, all of those who've lost uh, family or loved ones uh, in the pandemic, we extend our deepest condolences and sympathies to you. We've seen as well this week numbers rising in Gauteng and the Eastern Cape. Eastern Cape Health Department under extreme pressure as cases start to rise and clearly the province was not able to use the lockdown period to extend its capacity. The MEC admitting uh, two days ago that her department is essentially bankrupt. Now, the last thing you want in a health pandemic is to have a health department going bankrupt. And once again, it's a sign of the pandemic meeting head on with the incapable state and how important it is for provinces, for local government and for national government to make sure that we're fixing the roof while the sun is shining, as Lesesha Kanyaho, our Reserve Bank governor, warned us that we can be prepared for these. Well, our Shadow Minister of Health, Seviwe Guarube, is on the ground in the Eastern Cape, and we hope to have her in studio next week, sharing with us the latest information, what she's been able to establish on the ground there, getting to grips with why the numbers are rising in the Eastern Cape and why the health response uh, has been so poor in that particular province. As I said earlier, we really enjoy the feedback that we get, and one of the topics which has been consistent throughout is the whole issue of UIF, the Unemployment Insurance Fund, as the economic effects of the government's lockdown start to bite very hard into South Africans' back pockets and into the viability of households, it is the topic that we receive by far the biggest volume of requests for information on. How do we access UIF? Why is it not being paid? What is the status of the TERS funding? Uh, and uh, is really starting to see the sense of desperation from so many South Africans who, 100 days into the lockdown, are still waiting for even the first payment. Well, I'm joined in studio today by Michael Bagram, uh, who is both a labor expert, a labor lawyer, uh, owns a very successful labor practice called Bagram's, uh, but we're also lucky because he's a DA member of parliament. And so he's been really on the front line every single day, assisting ordinary South Africans and the party to deal with the myriad of queries we're receiving on a regular basis from you at home around your UIF and TERS applications. We're going to be unpacking a little bit about where the problems lie, what is happening, and the big question on everybody's mind is the UIF running out of money? And uh, this is obviously an important point for us to look into. Then I'm joined uh, a bit later by Sean Boerter, who runs the Sabi Star. It's a small catering, self-catering bed and breakfast in Mpumalanga, who will share his experiences uh, of being not only a small business holder in the tourism space, which has been very badly affected, but also his interactions around trying to access relief funding at that particular time. So do stay tuned. Uh, it's going to be an exciting episode. Well, Michael, uh, we're going to have to get you a, you know, a, a Corona cast T-shirt. You've been here. I think you're the most popular guest. And certainly when, uh, when you're on the show, the numbers go up. I'm not sure if it's your family that are tuning in to watch or broader community, but it's always so great to have you on the show, Michael, and welcome back to Corona cast. Thank you. Unfortunately, I've only got good, bad news. And this is the terrible thing about me coming back here. Um, I have had a torrid time since we were last uh, talking on the Corona cost. Mm -hmm. um, and as the, the Democratic Alliance warned us 
mm. as we were going into this, mm. that the destruction to the economy will probably be far worse than the virus itself. Mm. Uh, the Democratic Alliance researchers and our team mm. looking at this warned us long time mm. ago that this will happen. And sure enough, it's come to mm. pass. And maybe someone should have listened to the Democratic Alliance mm. beforehand. And when you made that statement almost two months ago uh, that we in for a torrid time with the economy, you were absolutely mm. correct. Our government mm. hasn't helped us. They failed the people. And in particular, the Department of Employment and Labor has done us a complete disservice. Mm. And that's what we wanted to talk about today. Mm. Yeah. Michael, I mean, there's been so many queries and so much information uh, requested from people who are not able to access the websites, who are not able to access uh, uh, call the, through the call centers, that we've now established a UIF bulletin, which is broadcast every Wednesday morning. Do you want to just tell the viewers a little bit about that and why you felt it important to start that? Yeah, we did. Our, our research team came up with, obviously, answers, and they wanted to get that message out to the people, to mm. the voters and to the citizens of South Africa. Mm. The bottom line is that things are changing so rapidly and deteriorating so badly that mm. we thought we'd have a special broadcast of UIF from the Democratic Alliance mm. to tell people what's happening. Mm. Um, Parliament itself is trying to stifle that sort of feedback. And the only people that are actually giving information is the Democratic Alliance. And it's so strange because this is not a political issue. The Democratic Alliance doesn't see this as politics. We mm. see this as survival of our people, of mm. South African citizens, and obviously anyone that's working here. Mm. So what we're not looking at the politics of it, we're looking at mm. information and the wherewithal, the tools, how to actually get mm. access to your payment. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to do. So we're going to be mm -hmm. on tomorrow morning, Wednesday, the next one. Uh, there's interesting information there, so please tune in mm -hmm. if you can. Um, mm -hmm. We want people to get that information and to start working on this so that we get the government to at least listen mm -hmm. to the people. So let's talk. In a crisis like this, uh, UIF is established to deal with uh, crises like this. SASA is created to deal with crises like uh, food insecurity and vulnerable households, uh, tours. If one looks at the uh, experience from governments around the world, they've been very quickly able to get money into the system, into the hands of people who needed it, particularly small business owners, and to help their employees. And as a result of that, their economic recovery will, after COVID is going to come a lot quicker. That's not the case in South Africa. Where is the obstacle and what has gone wrong? Well, the money we had, mm. um, I, how much has been stolen, I don't know, and mm. you've touched on that. And mm. I, my colleague, Dr. Michael Carter from mm. the Democratic Alliance, has actually just put out a statement to this mm. effect. He's asking uh, what's mm. happening. He, hasn't get any, he doesn't get any answers, mm. but at least we're asking. Mm. The point, I think, the reality is that we can't somehow organize it. We can't, as a government, somehow they have not got the administration right. Um, we can ask our colleague, Democratic Alliance uh, representative Bridget Masango, will tell you what's happened with mm. Sasa. Mm. Same story. Somehow our mm. government cannot organize anything. Mm. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to say they can't organize a piss up in a brewery. Well, this is a family <laughs> show, Michael, so you're going to have to. <laughs> Sorry about that. But, but I mean, this is, it's, it's basically reached the point where you, it's almost like having a fire department where there's a fire and they go to, you know, get the fire engine out to go and put the fire out and the engine's gone. Uh, you wow. know, it's got all the facade there that it's there. Everybody thinks that it's there to help. But in the time of greatest need, it's missing in action. Yeah. And what do the commissioners say? What does the minister say? I mean, when, when you take these issues up with them. I'm sure well, you stopped taking your calls now. But. Well, yes. <laughs> and I, I get approximately 300 emails a day. Mm. And of those 300, I get about 100 that have to be sent on mm. to the commissioner and to the minister and to the DG, the director general of the department. Mm. There are certain individuals that are answering me, but it doesn't really mm. help the actual situation. Mm. And your fire engine example is a good one because we've got the fire engine. Mm -hmm. We've actually got an engine and it can be started, but no mm. one knows how to drive it. Mm, okay. That's the real problem. No one mm. knows how to get it out of the fire station. Mm. So the money might be there, but it's not flowing to the people. Mm. And 
you know, insurance. This is what it is. The UIF is insurance mm. for when something goes wrong. Mm. It's, and it doesn't belong to government. Mm. This money belongs to the people. Mm. And somehow it's not flowing to the people. Mm. And all you need is someone who can effectively administer it, but mm. no. But there's a good point you make. And, you know, it's that old adage, there's no such thing as government money. There's only citizens' money. Where is this UIF fund being built up? How much was in it and how was it built up? Well, it's quite simple. It was built up by 1%, and you'll hear that from Sean. He pays mm. it in every month for mm. each employee, 1% of the payroll he pays in. Mm. The employees get deducted from their salary 1%, mm. which they religiously mm. pay over to the UIF. So nothing belongs to government at so all. So this is not government who's been putting money away for no, a rainy day. No, no, this no. is savings, essentially so insurance saving by the people of South Africa. That's it's it. their money. It's not Correct. government's money. And government was merely there to administer that. That's all mm. they're supposed to do. So it's simple. Money belongs to the people, belongs to the employers and the people. They've put it away for a 20, rainy day. To a rainy day for 20, 30 years. Some people have been working. And that money has been invested through the PIC, the Public Investment mm. Corporation. There was 140 billion rand, which then. The president so gleefully said, well, we're going to put aside 40 billion, not of his money. Mm. He was going to put aside 40 billion of the people's money to pay the people. Now, when you got, and it's typical of, of insurance, of course, mm. because when you now have the rainy day, who's going to give you the umbrella? Well, mm. government hasn't given us any umbrella. Mm. Uh, they're pretending that it's their money. They're pretending mm. that they can give it to the people, but mm. it's not actually flowing. Mm. And this is what we're experiencing. So where mm. we are right now is there's still people who haven't worked since the end of March. Remember the lockdown mm. was at the end of March. People haven't got their salary since then. And many people, when they put in the claims in April, still haven't got their April money. So are you telling me there's people from the very first get-go who've now going to go into the 100th day on Saturday without earning a single cent? And, Absolutely. And the insurance was put aside... I mean, this is why so many households are surely on the brink of financial of disaster. Well, I, 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 I get emotional about mm -hmm. this because I have, unfortunately, people phoning me. Normally, mm -hmm. the mother of the household mm -hmm. phones me, emails me, begs mm -hmm. and says, I cannot put even a plate of samp on the table mm -hmm. for dinner. I cannot do it. I don't have mm -hmm. it. They've forgotten about niceties such as rental and telephone and all that's gone. People, when they have to email me, have to go to friends to email me because they've got no more airtime yeah. at all. They've got no access to the email. Mm -hmm. We are on our hands and knees begging at this point. Mm -hmm. And I've now got to the point where I'm begging as well. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, please, to the minister, please answer me. He's never answered me, not mm -hmm. once, not mm -hmm. once. And I've sent hundreds of emails. There is the commissioner. The commissioner very happily is answering me and telling me that he, he's hoping to help. He even appointed an, an individual specifically to help me. Mm. Jeffrey Malaluki is a wonderful guy, and he was appointed mm. specifically to help me. But you can't, you, you can't do this when I'm sending him 200 a day, plus he's getting other stuff coming mm. in. What does he do? So he mm. helps 10, 15 people a day, mm. but that doesn't help the people of South Africa. Mm. This should have gone over to SARS. You called, you put out a press mm. release two months ago mm. saying hand it over to SARS, to the Revenue Service, who mm. have got all the information. This could have flowed very easily and quickly. And as we know, we're ruthlessly efficient. <laughs> well, yes, and, and thank God for that. <laughs> We've got a new commissioner who actually is quite good <coughs> of SARS, and they could have, they've got everyone's information. They could have paid out this money without all the hardship and the the unpleasantness. Mm. And what are we doing? We are killing our people. Mm. That's what we're doing. But, I mean, the point that you're making, Michael, is simply this. I mean, by the time this money ever reaches homes, it's going to be too late. Um, you know, there's you know, only a finite number. South Africa is one of the lowest savings rates in the world, so it's not like people have got household mm. savings to fall back on. Uh, inflation has gone through the roof. Food prices during this period have skyrocketed. Um, it really is a perfect storm of misery and suffering. And now is the winter of our discontent, as I think the, the famous uh, saying goes. Yeah. So when you're losing a war, you change the generals. What, what could we do tomorrow 
to get a system in place to fix this and, and deal with the backlog? Well, quite simply, with the, and as the Democratic Alliance, we've said this, mm. hand it immediately over. And this is not, the TERS is coming to an end, by the mm. way. Mm. The big announcement we've got to make today mm. is that the minister announced yesterday that he mm. will not be increasing the TERS into July. So the last payment will be for June 2020. And some people haven't even got that. Uh, yet. Some, some people haven't got April yet, but mm -hmm. the last payment, if a payment comes, mm -hmm. will be for June. And in fact, only up until this morning, it wasn't even open to claim for June. And mm -hmm. obviously the workforce normally get paid around about the 25th mm -hmm. of the month. So, you, And we know that it takes at least two, three weeks, even if it's running mm -hmm. smoothly, to pay. Mm -hmm. So people, you're not going to get your money for June. You're only going to get it sometime in July, but there's no claim for July. And as you know, John, and you've been shouting about this, they've still closed down half our workforce mm. um, and they're not earning. And there's no special payment for them mm. at all. As we now creep into the period of the retrenchments, because as you know, Treasury said we're going to retrench three to seven million extra people over about the 10 million mm. that have been sitting home before tour. So we, we're not coming into this healthy we're coming into this as a broken nation. You remember that the whole era of Zuma destroyed mm. our nation. We were hoping mm. to have this so-called new dawn, which mm. actually was a very bad sunset. Mm. And this wasn't bad. This was bad. Mm. This made it even worse. So under mm. the new dispensation of Ramaphosa, mm. we lost more and more jobs every single quarter. Mm. We have been going downhill every quarter. Then what happens? We have the electricity problem. Then we have the water problem, then electricity again. And now we get hit with COVID. Yeah. And of course, our government cannot organize anything. And they've made it worse and worse. So now we're having the business community on its hands and knees. Business is closing. They'll never open again. Mm -hmm. What can we do as the Democratic Alliance? Mm -hmm. We can make sure that the administration comes right. Mm -hmm. And with that, give some hope. And with mm -hmm. hope, we can start then opening businesses. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're starting to do in the Cape Province. Yeah. They're opening it up. And so I'm starting to see some life in the Cape Province because the Democratic Alliance government mm -hmm. is looking at the revival of the mm -hmm. business community, which in turn puts yeah. money onto the table. Yeah. I'm going to go next to, to Sean. But before I do that, and we'll come to Sean, but to give us sort of a real world example, just to give evidence, this is not something you and I are sitting talking about in the studio. It's happening uh, out there on the ground. But it's exactly this. It's about lives and livelihoods. It's about ensuring that we have uh, uh, protecting and balancing lives on the one hand, dealing with the pandemic, but also making sure that we protect people's livelihoods. All very well and good, as I've said, in countries where they've been able to inject the money into the economy to keep it going and help small business. Here you're keeping businesses locked down, essentially, but and you're killing economic activity, uh, and then you're not you know, providing the stimulus package on, on the other side. And then when government gets money in, it spends it on the wrong things. It doesn't buy infrastructure and build, it spends it on a huge public service wage bill. And I think Leon Schreiber, uh, our colleague, has done yeah. a great job here showing that I think what 68 cents in every rand now goes towards Payment uh, of salary. To payments of salary. I mean, so there's mandatory. very little left over. But I think it's a good time to bring Sean Boerta in from Sabi Stan. Sean, uh, thank you for uh, joining us today from Mpumalanga province. Uh, certainly the, what the, the sun, Sunshine province, I think they call it. Uh, and uh, welcome mm -hmm. to CoronaCast, Sean. Um, well, you've been listening to what we've been talking about. You want to give us a little bit of experience. Uh, first of all, obviously, you're in the tourism business, which has been hit really hard. And now you've had the double whammy of, of uh, inefficiency around the UIF. Do you want to just take us through your experience? Well, since, since, since the cast is about UIF today, let's stick with that, because otherwise we could talk about many things. But... Mm -hmm. Essentially, yeah, I think with, with regards to the UIF, in, in my specific case, it's, it's the, the problem actually stemmed from, from a system that was faulty and broken down way before COVID hit us. Um, and, and certainly in my case, the, the, the problem stemmed from, from way before COVID um, in the sense that there was a problem with, 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 the, with the UIF. And for months and months, and I mean, you've seen the paper trail, you've seen the email trail, um, nobody could fix it up and nobody could correct the problem. 
Um, and of course, eventually, when COVID hit us, um, you know, then it just snowballed. And and my question really is, at the end of the day, is um, why 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 do my staff have to suffer for this? You know, um, they've paid the one percent. I've paid it across to to, to the government. Um, and yeah, you're quite right, um, Michael. You mentioned Jeffrey's name. I think he he's the guy who sent me the emails. Um, and but you know it's a little bit too late and even then they couldn't fix the problems then uh, they certainly can't seem to fix the problems um, now so I must be honest as I sit here I, I don't expect any payment for my staff um, obviously I've been trying to help them as much as I can out of pocket as we've been trying to carry on um, you know and uh, it's basically just a disaster you know it's broken Sean how many how many employees do you does your business employ there uh, at your at your uh, accommodation uh, I'm a small little business I'm only 10 people um, including myself so you know we're we a small little business um, but you know when you talk about small little businesses there's hundreds of small little businesses so when you add them all up Mm. I'm just wondering what the overall effect is, you know? Cumulative effect. So did you have the same experience then, Sean? You've been writing emails uh, right at the beginning, and, and have you received any payments at all during this period? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, the, the, the UIF has, has basically relied on two technicalities, um, both which I might add is actually fault of their own, not my fault, um, to, to, to not pay. Um, and yeah, no, we haven't received any payment, not a single cent. So there's 10 people there that have not received a cent since the beginning of the crisis. I mean, that is absolutely astounding. And I'm sure that some of your staff, I mean, they've got extended family that rely on, on their salaries. Uh, we're ready to have an, a huge unemployment problem in the country. So you'd probably find that, that some of those staff are, are supporting uh, supporting extended uh, extended families far beyond the reach of of, uh, of of what would happen in a normal functioning economy. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we're all very aware that that um, you know, in, in in the South African situation, each salary earner is supporting numerous extended family members. You know, so it's it's really a hard hit. You know, it's hard hitting for mm -hmm. for these people, for our staff members. Mm -hmm. And Sean, I mean, you've had now the double whammy because you've uh, obviously the the leisure tourism section is uh, is relatively uh, you know dead at the moment and, and not able. And the the regulations that came out this week are as clear as mud. And you've got these ridiculous situations where you know you can go and hang out at a casino, but you can't go and book a self catering uh, accommodation. Uh, is your setup there able to uh, you know, allow? Uh, the protocols of COVID to be observed and, and open if you were given the go-ahead? Absolutely. I mean, we, we, we totally compliant with what the industry has put up. Um, we actually, in ideal situation in the country, especially the country's resource, because we, we spread out over space, each unit is out on their own, there's certainly no crowding of people into, into corridors and things like that. Um, you know, each one of my units have got their own entrance, etc. Um, so yeah, we are ideal. Um, you don't really want to get me started on, on, mm. on the whole thing with the permits and stuff for operation right in the beginning either. Mm. Um, that we could sp spend another half an hour on, but mm. the, the yeah, you know, the logic uh, I'm not going to rehash. There's some, so many logical errors that have been made, but certainly, yeah, I think that you know, you, you, you sort of and I sympathise with the government in some senses because they, we are making hard decisions at this point in time. Mm. But, you know, at this point in time, more than ever, we need rationality. Mm. Um, we, we need to understand that, that we, we can't kill our industries. Uh, people coming in from a, a couple, they, they, they live together, they're married, they're driving the same car across the border into a unit, and they, they hardly come into contact with anybody. They're coming to shopping grocery stores where there's a lot less people than in Gauteng, for instance. Uh, it's a safe environment, okay? Um, so, certainly, keep your, your, your COVID. You know, when, when you come in, you book with me, you get your temperature taken, you everything gets sanitized. We, we Especially in our industry, any, uh, touch, uh, any service that is frequently touched gets sanitized after every touch. I mean, we, we're highly, very, very careful, and, and we're all following these guidelines. 
Um, you know, we we all joining in with 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 the movements like Knightsbridge had started with the Stay Safe um, logo. Mm -hmm. um, I you know I think we're in a, a very responsible industry. To be quite mm -hmm. frank, um, I think the hospitality industry is a very responsible industry, setting very very high standards internationally. Um, we've got to bear in mind that we deal with, with, with people. I mean, last year I catered for people from 36 countries. Okay. Um, you know, so, so we exposed to international markets with, with extremely high standards and, um, we meet those standards. We always have, otherwise we wouldn't still be in business, mm -hmm. you know, and, and to punish our industry, I think when, uh, well, let's not relate to any other industries that have been on the news lately, but I mean, it's, it's, it, it, I think it's, it's irrational. Well, if hairdressers can open safely, restaurants can open safely, uh, casinos can open safely, uh, I don't see a reason why we, you know, we shouldn't be opening up, given the fact that tourism is such a, a, a gateway job creation uh, engine room in, in the country. Uh, and you know, it's always been, you know, particularly for a province like Mpumalanga and particularly a town like Sabi, uh, it's really the lifeblood of, uh, you know, that keeps that local economy moving there. Absolutely. I mean, Sabi, um, it's certainly the, the, the secondary, the second most important industry um, in the town. And this, there is obviously the forestry and the sawmills. But over, the, over time, I think that the tourism has sort of become quite a big part of the economy, um, the local economy. So there's a lot of people um, suffering. You know, um, certainly let's let's put it. Let's just correct the thing: is we are open, okay, mm -hmm. under the under level three now mm -hmm. with the West End, we are open. But the problem is we have no access to our market. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the the we have a sport, a, a, especially a province like Mpumalanga, which which hasn't got huge populations and so on. Um, we don't have a huge local market in our mm -hmm. industry. You know, so yeah, we need the people from Hateng. We, yeah. we we need the people from the other provinces, yeah. from Limpopo and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. Um, but yeah, I do believe we can do it safely. I don't. Yeah. I don't believe that we're going to contribute to increasing the curve by opening self catering or even hotel accommodation. You know, as I said, I think we are a very responsible industry, mm. um, and and the government should show show us due respect in that. Some faith, yeah. And as you know, the point we made earlier, it would be all right if you had your doors closed and you were getting your funding and you got your sectoral funding and your employees got the UIF it would probably make the blow uh, a lot softer. But, you know, you've, you, your business has been shut for a long period of time. You have not been getting your UIF, and this obviously causes huge amounts of, of difficulty for, for you as an employer. It must be heartbreaking to have to look at your employees and, uh, you know, have to go to them every week and explain to them why the UIF check hasn't arrived. Well, yeah, I think the sad thing is that our employees actually do understand um, you know, I think I think what we what 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 we've got to realise is that everybody has just eventually got to this point where oh no, the government's broken again. You know, we're not going to get UIF, we're not going to get this. Um, and we all understand. You know, I think Michael mentioned earlier on that. Um, you know, where's the money going? I think everybody in South Africa, including my staff, are sitting around and saying, not. How you know whether there's money being stolen? It's just how much. Okay, mm -hmm. you know um, my staff have actually been really surprisingly supportive, um, mm -hmm. but unfortunately and and unfairly so. You know because they also realise that we've got a problem in the country. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. So even where governments had good intentions, it's just run headlong into the incapable state that just is unable to deliver this. And unfortunately, we have seen the corruption. There was a case last week that we dealt with uh, where some guy got a huge chunk of UIF money, but it was in and out of the bank account before you before anyone could get onto it. Luckily, there have been some arrests, but I mean, I'm sure that's replicated hundreds of times over because people take advantage of, of broken systems. Well, Sean, um, we wish you all the best and thank you very much for making time to be with us today. And, Give us the real world lived experience. You know, I think that a lot of time politicians and people who aren't in those industries don't really get to grips and understand just how devastating this can be for a business owner as well as an, uh, an employer. Uh, and thank you very much for sharing your perspectives uh, today. And uh, I certainly look forward to once the interprovincial travel and that can lift up to, to come, and, uh, come and have a visit up with you there. And, uh, and, and certainly what I think is one of the most beautiful parts of the world. So 
Thank you very much for being with us today, Sean. It's only a pleasure, John. Great. Thank you very much for Thanks, having me. Thanks, Sean. Well, Michael, we've had a number of queries coming through. And, you know, one of the things that people have been sending through while we've been on the show is, um, uh, you know, is, is a salary. So um, Wesley Jackson says here, if it is ending today after three months, but short time is still at work and is extended in the tourism section, is this legal? I mean, can they still extend short time in, uh, if, if yeah. Open. Look, uh, absolutely correctly, they can do so. And obviously, if there's a bargaining council, you would do it in terms of the bargaining council. Mm -hmm. If there isn't, um, people can have a claim against the UIF. It mm -hmm. won't be the TERS claim. Mm -hmm. There'll be a claim against the UIF. Of course, the real mm -hmm. problem is, will they pay? Yeah. Um, and I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, the story we've heard now from Sean mm -hmm. um, is an unbelievable one because... That is the engine room of job creation mm, small, small business. businesses. Yeah. And I think everyone, every economist around the world know that small business. And what mm. we've done as a government, when I say we, not us, but mm. the government, what they've done is they've deliberately gone out and destroyed small business. Mm. Because small business is just not getting any support at mm. all. We've even got a department called the Small Business uh, Department. Mm. Um, I don't think they've act they're missing in action. But as useful as the Gauteng Harbors Department. Well, that's that's exactly <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, you know, quite true because yeah. our small business department. Mm. Um, who, has anyone heard of them? Yeah. Has anyone seen them do anything? Mm. No, and here we have... Well, I think they're determined to turn all big business into small business in South Africa for the current uh, trend continues. That's continue. how you make a small fortune yeah. in South Africa. You start with a <laughs> big, big fortune. fortune yeah. But the, the problem mm. we've got mm. is that we know, everyone mm. knows, that small business is the job creation. Yeah. We also know that Sean's example of what he gave us of his mm. staff, the statistics tell us that every employee in South Africa is looking after five others. Mm. So he's got 10 people. That's 50 people we're mm. talking about that are starving. Yeah. He, lucky for them, is helping them. Mm. He's helping his staff, and that's why they understand. But mm. what about the small business that can't help their staff? Mm. Are they trying to put a piece of bread on mm. the table themselves? And mm. so, yeah, we've, we've got a real problem. Mm. So this person who's now going to get less money has to at least mm. claim from the UIF. And that's the only way you're going to be able to do it. There mm. is a claim from the UIF. The problem is you're going to be competing now with about three to seven extra million people claiming for the payments after mm. they've been retrenched. Mm. Because when you get retrenched, you're entitled to mm. UIF. That's why you've been saving in yeah. the insurance fund. I don't know if the money is there. Yeah. I know Dr. Cardo has asked, is the money still there? Is there something to pay out these people? No one's answered him. Yeah. So, as I say, talk is cheap. Money buys the whiskey, and uh, we want to see the money. I think that's the important thing. Michael, uh, people are asking, what's the difference between UIF and TERS? Do you just want well, to give a it's brief the same thing. The UIF, the Unemployment Insurance Fund, mm -hmm. the special fund under the UIF was put together because the promise was made by our president mm -hmm. that you will get paid during this three months. Mm -hmm. That was a promise. Of course, the devil's in the details, and so no one, no one mm -hmm. actually realized that it's all very well for him to say it and people to applaud. Then mm -hmm. you want to see the detail. You want to see actual payments. Mm -hmm. Now we kick back to the UIF itself, the Unemployment Insurance mm -hmm. Fund, and then if you get retrenched or if you get maternity leave or if someone passes away, then you mm -hmm. would claim from the UIF itself, which goes to the uninsur Unemployment Insurance Fund legislation, mm -hmm. and then you can claim there. And there they claim they work out how long you've been there and there's a formula as to what mm. you would get paid for. Mm. It was recently, about a year ago, extended, um, but I'm not sure, again, if the money is there. Okay. Well, let's get to some of the questions that have been asked because, uh, yeah. you know, the viewers during the course of the week have been um, writing in. And the first one comes from Mornay van der Linde. And he says, on the 21st of May, Human Resources already send our sent our UIF U19 forms to be manually uploaded, but still nothing. We've tried U filing, but it shows your account is locked. Is there any other way we can get this resolved 
because three months uh, uh, Mornay has been sitting without a salary already. Well, Mornay, I, I put out a hand of friendship to you and I will follow up from, mm. you will obviously email me after mm. this and give me your details. Mm. I need your ID number, the business number, the registration Yeah, number. he's got all that. He sent and it through. And if we get so through, can, yeah. I will then have to write to mm. the commissioner on your behalf because that is the only way now. It's become tedious, but we have to mm. actually write on behalf of each individual. Mm. And that's what we're doing. So, As a democratic alliance, we are <laughs> writing to the commissioner mm. probably three, four hundred times a day and saying, look at Mornay, look at his specific circumstances and pay him. Mm. And we've actually had to be as blunt as that. And then we're getting some payment. So, I mean, let's talk about the, who's supposed to be doing this work. I mean, how many employees are there in a department like UIF? And, and what are they doing in this, in this time? I, I think, well, first of all, as weird as it may seem, they closed down all the UIF offices. They decided that they weren't an essential service. The president offers their service. They closed down. Most of the people went home. There, were no, you, there was no walk-in place, nowhere where you can go. And I don't know what happened to them. I think they all went fishing. And they left the people of South Africa sitting at home starving. Mm. And yes, we had a few people in the head office who were answering me. But this is, not a, this is not an exercise in fun. This is an exercise of real lives, real starvation, mm. and absolute agony. People are mm. going through agony. I spoke mm. to a lady today. She said, what do I tell my children? Mm. And I said, you know, I don't know. I don't mm. know what to tell your mm. children. She said, well, when am I going to get the money? I said, I don't know. Mm. I said, I will follow her personally, and I have done, and mm. I will get her money for her. But this mm. is what's happened. But I mean, it shouldn't be like this. This should be, this should be as, a simple, easy process. It should be a simple transaction, uh, standard forms uh, that you easy. submit on, uh, uh, you know, computerized processes, and it should just be able to, to spit it out. I mean, they, they're very quick to do the deductions and to, to take the money, but very slow to pay out, it seems. And that would have been so simple when mm. the Democratic Alliance gave mm. a solution. Yeah. Up SARS. Front. SARS. Yeah. Yeah. SARS has got Go your the, bank they've account. They've got all the bank account. They've got yeah. the names. You yeah. pay to SARS. Mm. We pay it to SARS mm. in the first place. Mm. It's very easy for them to say, all right, we'll pay back. Yeah. Quite Doesn't simple. Doesn't make sense to me. So here we go, Margot Overbeek writes, and I desperately need help in claiming from the fund, which we've been paying to for nearly two years. This morning, something alarming happened. I logged into the tour site with my login details and my UIF reference, and another company's details came up, all of it, ID numbers, bank accounts, how much has been paid out to them, their remuneration amounts. This is very alarming because it seems to show a serious breach of security on the site. How is that possible? Well, there you are. Uh. That shows you that there's a complete and utter mess. It is possible because she is not the first person to tell me that. Mm. I have dozens of those types of emails. Now, you take a screenshot of that. Mm. You, if you are of a fraudulent disposition, mm -hmm. you could actually, you know, got access to every single Bank thing. accounts, ID Everything. numbers. I uh, mean, it's just unbelievable. Uh, Never mind Poppy and all those fancy pieces of legislation uh, that you and I sit and debate uh, all day in Parliament. Uh, here you are, just hand it out. Give mm. it to whatever company you feel like doing. Mm. I mean, it shows that there's complete and utter breakdown mm. of the administration. It, it, there's no mm. other reason for it. Okay, so here's another one from Idlevass Taylor. It also seems like a bit of an administrative nightmare. Uh, my employer applied for the COVID-19 UIF TERS fund on my behalf and, um, for April and May, uh, which he said he received. So that's some good news. He was then retrenched at the end of May and went to the Department of Labor to apply for normal UIF, where he was informed that he couldn't apply for UIF as he's still registered for TERS and that his employer should remove his name from the system. He contacted the ex-employer from which he was retrenched and asked him to do that, and he reported back that the system would not process the cancellation. Uh, he inquired at UIF this morning and was told that they were aware of the problem and that he should wait until the beginning of July to see whether his name was taken off because the COVID UIF is only for three months. In the interim, he said he'll have no income due to incompetence. Uh, what if his name is not removed and they then decide to extend the TERS period? Well, we've already heard that. Well, they're not going to extend, not gonna extend the, the TERS period. But that's still not good news for him. Yeah. Because they're not saying it will be done. Mm. They were saying wait until the end mm. of this period. Yeah. But you know what's going to happen. Mm. We're having 
we've had X amount of people now apply for TERS, mm. those unemployment claims from retrenchment are going to ratchet up at an incredible pace. Mm. And of course, now that the UIF offices are open, you must see the chaos that's going. Mm. I went to go and visit one of these UIF mm. offices in Cape Town. There's no distancing. Social distancing. There's, distancing no, there's nothing. And there's people can't go inside. And they mm. all hundreds of people in queues, mm. all on top of each other with a security guard shouting, don't hold your breath. Mm. You're not going to get your money in a hurry. Mm. And I'm sorry to tell you this, but we've got to be real. We've got to say that they are so messed up that they're not going to be able to do it properly. What, uh, to, what, let's just talk a little bit pray. about legal recourse, Michael. I mean, surely with such institutional failure, there's a, there's a case to be made for... There is a group of people that are getting in one of the companies. I spoke to them this morning, okay. actually. They're getting together. They've briefed attorneys. They've briefed advocates. They want to sue the department. Mm. Um, I'm not so sure in terms of the legal recourse that there is, but here's your money that you're trying to get access to, and government has somehow put a handbrake on it. Yeah. So Rowena writes in here. She said she started her maternity leave in February. Uh, she's only received one payment in April and nothing uh, there. She says there's been constant backwards and forwards between herself and the paymaster, and her status at present still shows sent to paymaster. The status has also been so since the last payment, um, and... Um, she knows that they are prioritizing the TERS payment, but surely claims that have been logged before then should take priority as well. So I suppose people mm. had claims in the system have had them sort of blown out the water by, by the TERS well, uh, system as well. They've literally put them all on hold. Uh -huh. And here's a perfect example, yeah. but I get lots of those. Uh -huh. Not just the maternity leave. But so they the just put those two, two to one side and said, look, we'll you know, worry about that like afterwards. Like they did with all the foreign workers uh -huh. in South Africa. They put them to one side and said, look, sorry, we, we're going to investigate. Yeah. So, I, again, she is entitled to get the money. She mm. must keep pushing. And, again, we will follow up on her behalf. Yeah. Bev Yoko writes in to us from, uh, from the online platform today. There are foreigners who have work permits paying UIF, but are declined because they are foreigners. Why is this the case? Well, they've promised us it's not the case. They've said mm. what they're doing is they're getting out of home affairs and they're getting the information from Home Affairs as to whether their work permit's in mm. order. They then feed that back to the Department of Employment and Labor. Mm. They then collate the two and pay them. Mm. Now, you've got a Home Affairs Department that's dysfunctional. Mm. You've got a Department of Employment and Labor that's dysfunctional. You've got two mm. dysfunctional departments talking to each other. Mm. You can imagine who's caught in the middle is the foreign workers. They're getting nothing. Um, some are starting to get paid. Um, so I've seen some of those April payments come through to the foreign workers, mm -hmm. which is a bit horrific to think about, but it has been happening. My office had three successes this morning. Mm -hmm. So um, we are getting there. Again, um, it's dysfunctional. And, okay, Marietta Hernkamp writes in, if you work only two weeks a month instead of the full month, must your employer apply for UA for the two weeks you're not working and not getting paid? Absolutely. Okay. Yes, they must. And many employers are saying, no, I'm not going to do it because you're mm. all working. No. Tell your employer they must apply. Mm. Uh, it's not like we're trying to save the government money. Mm. It's your money. Get it. Mm. Michael, I mean, let's just talk a little bit about compliance now. You know, when a system breaks down so fundamentally as this UIF system is broken down, it obviously removes faith of business owners and employees in the system. Do you think that there's going to be a, a move after this to, for people to look at alternative ways of being able to insure against unemployment? Yeah, of course, some of the insurance companies have denied payments anyway. We've mm. seen that with the restaurant and mm. tourism industry. Uh, but there will be a restructure. Mm. Many employers are saying we need to look at somehow securing ourselves. We cannot rely on government, never mm. mind covid if anything else happens in the future, we can't rely on government. So what you've got is a business community that's saying we can't trust government. Mm. And they have to look at ways and means. I've been working with some businesses as to how they can do that. Mm. Um, there's going to be a complete rejig of our economy after this. But one thing that's given us a big fright is that we've always known our government's dysfunctional. Mm. Here we see when you're faced with a pandemic, Mm. of this nature, a black swan, really. Mm. 
that government is not going to be helping you at all. Mm. You can't rely on the South African government. A fellow told me last week, he said, my South African passport is not worth two cents. Mm. He said, that's how I feel at the moment. My yeah. passport and my citizenship is not mm. worth two cents because I don't get the two cents. Mm. Yeah, you know, I think it's a lot of people have been very frustrated. I mean, I think particularly here of employees who've been playing over religiously for years, employers who've been mm. keeping their books, you know, doing doing right by the employees. And, you know, now in the moment of need, nothing is there. And that must just be devastating well, for it's, people. It's heartbreaking yeah. because it affects you, it affects the employer, mm. it affects your family. And it affects your future. Mm. And of course, it's a knock-on effect of all of this. Let's mm. be honest. Uh, these are South Africans. They don't have income. It means they can't go to the shops to buy groceries. That means the shopkeeper loses out. They can't afford to bring in household services and pay for their rates, etc. You know, local government's going to no lose tax. out. And tax. There's no tax. So this is actually, a, you know, a self-perpetuating cycle now that we're getting into that's going to have even more disastrous effects on the economy than we would already have seen. Going well, into the Department of Labor has put us in a hole, mm. and they are continuing to dig that hole. Well, I think that's excavating they is, yeah, is that, the correct So they're continuing to dig further dirt mm -hmm. out of the hole mm -hmm. and throwing it at the people, and mm -hmm. we're going deeper and deeper into mm -hmm. that hole. There's got to be a, a silver lining somewhere. Mm. What think, is the silver lining? Let's talk I about that. I think the silver lining <laughs> is that businesses are rejigging themselves. Mm. South Africans are fantastic people. Let's Resilient. Face it. Mm -hmm. They are. They are innovative. Mm -hmm. We make plans. And my clients, my constituency, mm -hmm. my people that I'm speaking to every day mm -hmm. are doing the most amazing things to somehow, mm -hmm. they're saying, well, here we have it. We, we've mm -hmm. in this hole. We've got to dig ourselves out. Government's not going to help us. Yes, thank you for helping us and getting us a little bit of money mm -hmm. out of the tours. But let's make it work. Mm -hmm. And here you even have like one, what we spoke to Sean today. Mm -hmm. He's making it work. He's helping his people. Mm -hmm. They will be ready. When the visitors start coming mm -hmm. back, they'll be ready. So I'm having people doing the most amazing things, and especially small business. Mm -hmm. They say, I can't wait around for government anymore. Mm -hmm. Let's make this work. Let's do something that will make yeah. it work. And they are. Mm -hmm. And there is that silver lining. I think we're going to mm -hmm. come through this, despite government putting a handbrake on it. Mm -hmm. We're going to come through this and we're going to make it good. But and it can never be business as usual again with your life. There's got to be a no. fundamental change, Michael, in the way in which it is structured. And there's got to be resilience built into the system to deal with a crisis like this. We can't have the fire engine that nobody can drive when, when, when the fire starts. And so I think we need that's to have little thing. motorbikes mm. with a backpack with some water in it. Yeah. That's what we need so that we get can get to that fire and, and deal and with it. And that small business yeah. is going yeah. to gonna be our saviour yeah. for the future. So, Michael, obviously you continue to field the queries and obviously we encourage people to make contact with us and please be patient, of course. I mean, you're, you've spoken mm. to us about the volumes. Um, to keep an eye on the bulletin, but we're going to keep the pressure up. And uh, between you and Cardo and, uh, you know, Zach and Bele and the others in that cluster are going to just keep the pressure up relentlessly on government and then also start planning, which I'm very excited about, about what does a post-COVID world look like. And certainly for me, one of the key benefits is going to be in the cr next crisis we go to into a country, how do we get money and assistance needed overnight to the people who need it the most, because that's been the biggest, the, you know, the biggest Achilles heel in this thing is that when people have needed it, we haven't been able to get it into the system quickly enough. And I think it's a challenge for us as policy makers and, and lawmakers to be looking at how we do a fundamental reset and build a yeah. capable state uh, going forward. And uh, I think that's going to have to have to occupy well, us. as a democratic alliance, mm. every single shadow minister is putting mm. together a plan as they mm. move into the future. Mm. I've had a glimpse of some of mm. those plans. It's been fantastic. Mm. So we've mm. got good things around the yeah. corner. And yeah. let's, let's hope and pray that it's not completely destroyed by mm. our current rulers because yeah. we need to move forward. And Absolutely. You and I are going to make sure that uh, we are with the rest of the people who want mm. a good future, a bright future yeah. for us. And I think if people want to see the change, you're going to have to make that the change is now in their hands. I mean, yeah. and that's, Correct. You get the government you deserve, and um, you know, it all comes down to that important thing. And people who are suffering at this time must remember that it is intrinsically linked to 
how you cast your vote at the end of the day. If you want change, what is the old advert? You can stay as you are for the rest of your life or you can change to, to the DA. DA. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you, Michael, and thanks for being back. I'm sure it's not going to be the last time. Okay. I encourage, obviously, everyone to look at your bulletins on Wednesday, the UIF bulletin. Uh, where you're keeping uh, people updated into it. But thank you, Michael, for the work that you're doing. It's yeah. really great to work with you. And what never ceases to amaze you about you, Michael, is how you keep so cheerful in this. I really, my heart gets sore when I wow. read these emails. And it sometimes, I must be honest, some of them reduce me to tears uh, when yeah. you well, just see the immense likewise. suffering that's going on out there. So thank you for keeping your eye on the prize and uh, Understanding that we've, you know, we're in this together and we've got to fight our way out of it now. Let's yeah. keep pushing everyone. Yeah, so thank that's you. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Well, there you have it, folks. That's the program for this week. And I certainly hope that you found it as interesting as many of you have been saying on the comments. So thank you for those comments that have been coming through. Well, uh, some good news uh, as well. Uh, you may remember James Lorimer, who heads up the DA's work stream on food security, was on CoronaCast a couple of episodes ago, talking about our court case uh, against the Minister of Social Development for her attempts to try and stop community-based organizations, religious organizations, and others from being able to feed the poor and hungry in South Africa. Well, we won round one. Uh, she then last week gave it another uh, attempt, and we have been successful in stopping her from uh, getting her hands onto uh, the CBO and uh, community organizations and those feeding schemes. So for those of you out there uh, doing that work, feeding the hungry in a time where 51% of our households are food insecure, this shout out this week is to you. Please keep up that work. Uh, you know, if you could feed one person, uh, that's one more person that's going to uh, be going to bed, uh, not going hungry. Uh, I think we've got duties in our country as well as citizens to be our brother's keepers uh, in times of crisis. And when government has let us down, we only have each other. So let's stand together and get through this crisis. We also understand the difficulty that small business is going through. And we've spoken today with Michael and Sean about how important small businesses are uh, to our economy. So as part of our service and using our platforms, we want to help you if you are a small business owner. If you have a small business, you're selling products, on a Tuesday, it's going to be our uh, shout out for small businesses. Send us a short video clip. There's details on our website. Uh, and what we will do is share your business and service on the platform to try and help drive uh, some uh, activity and economic activity your way. We want to tell you as small business owners, you are important to us as South Africa. We cannot own the future if we don't have small businesses that are driving job creation in South Africa. So we want to play our part in making sure that you keep your doors open. Well, we're going to leave it there for this episode. I'll see you again on Friday at uh, same time, same place. And until then, stay safe, South Africa.